Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Janet May Johnson? Her story was covered in a New York Times article titled, Ghosts on the Glacier. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. Janet May Johnson was born on November 30, 1936, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Janet never knew who her birth mother was. She was adopted by a married couple named Victor and May Johnson. Victor ran a paper supply company owned by his family, and May was a bookkeeper. When Janet was 21, her adoptive parents discovered that she was gay. They sent her to a hospital in an effort to change her sexual orientation. Not surprisingly, this attempt was unsuccessful and motivated Janet to move away from home. She ended up in Denver, Colorado. In 1971, Janet earned a PhD in education from the University of Colorado. She worked as a librarian in Denver. In addition to being committed to education, Janet was interested in mountaineering. She eventually joined several clubs and traveled around the world climbing mountains. Janet was known for taking photographs during her journeys. Now moving to the timeline of the incident. One of the mountaineering clubs Janet belonged to was called the Mazamas Climbing Club. The leader of the club was an attorney from Portland, Oregon named Carmi Roy Defoe Jr. He planned an expedition to Mount Aconcagua in Argentina. It is part of the Andes mountain range. At 22,838 feet, it is the highest mountain in the Americas and the highest mountain in both the Western Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. Compared to other famous mountains that attract climbers, Mount Aconcagua is actually considered fairly easy to climb. It has been referred to as the highest non-technical mountain in the world. Despite this, the mountain has been the scene of many fatalities, partially because inexperienced climbers often select it. It may not be technically challenging, but the mountain is still very cold, and many of the deaths can be attributed to the weather. Carmi Defoe designed the expedition to climb the summit using a route on the northeastern side. This is referred to as the Polish route and involves a glacier referred to as the Polish Glacier. These names came from a 1934 expedition comprising climbers from Poland. It would appear that Janet Johnson was excited by Carmi's idea because she joined the expedition. In addition to Janet, six other people joined by June of 1972. A dairy farmer named Arnold McMillan, a police officer named Bill Zeller, a physician named Bill Eubank, a mental health professional named Jim Petrowski, a NASA engineer named John Cooper, and a college student named John Shelton. The oldest climber in the group of eight was Carmi at 52. The youngest was John Shelton at 25. 36-year-old Janet Johnson was probably the most experienced climber in the group. Unfortunately, a few of the group members were casual climbers who were accustomed to relatively light-duty hiking activity in the Pacific Northwest. Despite a lack of experience among the group members, Carmi was confident everyone was a strong climber. Even so, in November 1972, he reminded them to exercise a lot in preparation for the climb. In Argentina, the climbers were to be assisted by a local guide named Miguel Alfonso. He had climbed Mount Aconcagua five times, although he had only used the Polish route one time. In January 1973, the eight members of the expedition departed the United States and made their way to Argentina. The expedition started on January 20, and the members reached base camp at 13,500 feet the next day. There were three camps between the base camp and the 22,838-foot summit. Camp 1 was at 15,500 feet, Camp 2 was at 18,000 feet, and Camp 3 was at 19,400 feet. Carmi Defoe, John Shelton, and Bill Eubank stayed at Camp 1 and eventually returned to base camp. Their adventure had come to its conclusion. 
Their predicament could be thought of as a good opening for a joke, like a lawyer, a physician, and a college student walk into a base camp. Maybe Carmi should have taken his own advice about getting in shape. Janet Johnson, John Cooper, Miguel, the guide, and the three others climbed to Camp 2 and eventually to Camp 3. Jim Petrowski, the mental health professional, became ill and was taken back to base camp by the guide. This left only Janet Johnson, John Cooper, Arnold McMillan, the dairy farmer, and Bill Zeller, the police officer. The remaining four climbers pressed on toward the summit, but they stopped at about 21,000 feet, over 1,800 feet shy of the goal. The group had left most of their equipment and supplies at Camp 3 in order to push to the summit. They dug a hole in the snow using ice axes and slept on space blankets. Their intent was to continue climbing the next morning. Sometime around sunrise, John Cooper, the NASA engineer, decided that his journey was over. He started down the mountain toward Camp 3. This was about a two-hour hike. Bill Zeller would later say that he wasn't too worried about John going alone because John seemed to be capable and alert. Janet, the Ph.D., Bill, the police officer, and Arnold, the dairy farmer, continued toward the summit. As night once again approached, Bill and Arnold noticed that Janet was missing. They found her 100 feet off the trail in the snow. When they approached Janet, she said, quote, Don't make me suffer. Just let me lay here and die, unquote. Bill would later say that they had all camped together that night. Arnold had a different story. He said that Bill and Janet camped together, and he slept somewhere else. The next morning, Janet was in bad shape as the men tried to help her down the mountain. Her hands were swollen and black. They reached the hole that they had dug in the snow the day before and found a flare gun. Arnold fired it at 7 a.m., but no one responded. By this point, both Bill and Arnold were having hallucinations due to breathing the thin air. The men believed that Janet was doing better, so they decided that Arnold would go down the mountain alone to get help as Bill stayed with Janet. As it turns out, Arnold made better time than he thought. He lost his footing and slid a thousand feet down the mountain. He survived with only minor injuries and made it to Camp 3. Bill and Janet also fell and became separated as a result. When Bill went back to check on Janet Johnson, he found the body of John Cooper, the NASA engineer. As it turns out, John never made it back to Camp 3. Bill said that John was frozen and did not have any injuries consistent with falling. He assumed that John died from hypothermia. Instead of staying with Janet, Bill hiked toward Camp 3 alone. He believed that Janet was doing well by this point and would catch up with him. He arrived to find Arnold there, and the men went to sleep. The next morning, Janet had still not arrived. The men decided to abandon her and go down the mountain by themselves. The rest of the climbers were surprised that only two people came down the mountain when four had traveled up the mountain. Maybe instead of a PhD, an engineer, a police officer, and a dairy farmer, what they really needed was a mathematician. How is it possible that these two men left the other two climbers on the mountain? Not surprisingly, many people thought that Janet and John had been murdered. An investigation was started in Argentina. Not all the stories from the climbers matched, which only increased the level of suspicion. Ultimately, all the climbers left Argentina and were eager to frame the deaths as accidental. Some were angry that the government continued to investigate. Perhaps they were thinking, don't spy on me, Argentina. Later in 1973, as the investigation continued, John Cooper's body was recovered. He had a round hole in his abdomen that almost reached his spine, and his face was heavily damaged. Some believe that he fell on his ice axe and was unable to continue his descent. As a result, he froze to death. Later, an autopsy determined that he died from cranial contusions. On February 9, 1975, the body of Janet Johnson was recovered on a shallow slope in a field of ice just 65 feet from where John Cooper's body had been found. Her face had been badly injured and her eyeglasses were broken. There was a rock positioned on top of her body. Her body could not be recovered at that time, but in 1976, she was brought down the mountain. 
an autopsy revealed that Janet Johnson died from a brain injury. The investigation stalled, and no accusations were ever made in this case. Some people continued to believe that John and Janet were murdered. Others believed their deaths were accidental. In February of 2020, climbers found Janet's camera. Film from the camera and film from canisters in her backpack were recovered. Amazingly, the film was only slightly damaged and was successfully developed. Many people hoped that the photographs would unlock the secrets of Janet's death and maybe even John's death. As it turns out, the images had aesthetic value, but not investigative value. The last images that Janet captured were not far from the highest point that she reached on the mountain, but they did not point to any foul play. The discovery of the camera and the film did not allow the investigation to make any progress. The leader of the expedition, Carmi Defoe, died in 1975 in a motor vehicle collision in Moccasin, Montana. Bill Zeller, the police officer, died in 2003, and Arnold McMillan, the dairy farmer, died in 2011. In November of 2023, the last surviving member of the expedition, John Shelton, the college student, died. The story of Janet Johnson and John Cooper has led to a lot of speculation and even some conspiracy theories, but what happened remains a mystery. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, the fatal 1973 expedition to Mount Aconcagua seemed like an attempt to develop another sitcom like Gilligan's Island. This TV show, which ran from 1964 to 1967, featured characters with diverse backgrounds, like a PhD, a movie star, and a Wall Street millionaire. Also in alignment with Gilligan's Island, the members of the climbing expedition were unable to find success in their endeavors. One of the journalists who encountered the climbers believed that not all of them would return from the mountain. The climbers did not seem cohesive and were unprepared. The base camp manager said that the group had a lot of high-quality gear, but they did not have a group attitude. There was the sense that everyone was on their own. Based on John Cooper's diary, which was later recovered, it's clear he was no fan of Janet. He thought that she was only interested in getting to the summit, even if it meant other people doing most of the work. John was particularly offended that Janet was not feminine. Item number two, most members of the group had a helpful ability based on their career and other experiences. Like this was a dream team for climbing where everyone could make a unique and important contribution. For example, Janet was well-educated and a very experienced climber. Jim Petrowski was a mental health professional who could assess conditions like psychosis. Bill Eubank was a physician, which has clear utility on a mountain. John Shelton spoke Spanish. This was necessary because the guide only spoke Spanish. John Cooper had an impressive resume. He was a U.S. Coast Guard pilot, deep sea diver, had a degree in geological engineering, and worked as a surface operations engineer for NASA. John was familiar with hostile environments, like the surface of the moon. Carmi was a lawyer, which may not be too helpful on a mountain, but he was an experienced climber. Two of the climbers stood out from the group as maybe not having any ability that could contribute specifically to the expedition. Bill Zeller was a police officer, and Arnold McMillan was a dairy farmer. I can just imagine the other expedition members teasing these two, like their combined talent would only be useful if the expedition encountered an attack cow who needed to be arrested. As it turns out, the police officer and the dairy farmer made it to the highest point out of anyone on the trip. They were pretty resourceful and talented after all. Unfortunately, they were under suspicion as far as the two deaths, which kind of overshadowed their skills. Item number three, there was a lot of hope that Janet's camera would solve the mystery of the deadly expedition. Even though the photographs didn't crack the case wide open, there was some value there. One could argue the photographs proved that Janet was still in a frame of mind to be taking scenic shots. She probably wasn't in a life and death situation when the last photographs were taken. She was thinking clearly enough to operate the camera. It sounds like people became overly excited about the photographs. It's not clear what they expected to see in the images. Were they hoping that there would be an image of Bill or Arnold running toward the camera 
holding an ice axe. Maybe one of the men would be holding a sign that read, I'm ready to commit murder. The camera that Janet had was a Nikon consumer-grade 35mm. It wasn't like a modern digital camera where it's easy to take a lot of photographs quickly. Janet had to carefully plan out each shot, and the total number of images she could take was quite restricted. Item number four, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. This expedition was ill-advised and comprised people who were not ready to tackle Mount Aconcagua. They had a diversity of experiences and careers, which was fine, but they also possessed other diversity, which was not as helpful. For example, diversity of commitment, diversity of conditioning, and diversity of courage. When Janet and John found themselves in bad shape, Bill and Arnold did not recognize the gravity of the situation, and they started hallucinating. Janet and John both died from head injuries, which seems a bit suspicious, but the only killer involved was the mountain. Many of the members of the expedition had accomplished great things in life, especially as far as their careers. Perhaps they thought this would translate into climbing a mountain. Like if they were good at one thing, they were good at everything. Overconfidence was the most dangerous entity on the mountain. Now moving to my final thoughts. Janet's sister believed that Janet earned a PhD and climbed the tallest mountains in the world to prove to her mother that a gay person could be successful. It's likely that every other member in the group also had their own story of motivation. The motives must have been strong. The members were willing to band together with people they didn't know and had no particular reason to trust. I think the lesson learned in this case is how some missions require teamwork. Inefficiency and dangerousness are welcomed in its absence. Those are my thoughts on the case of Janet Mae Johnson. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.